Good morning, friends, and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. You remember well that we are in the last week of our lecture, and in this lecture, we are talking about marginalized voice. In the previous lecture, we talked about Jithail, and we could also see how his world comprises different sorts of realities. Again, in this lecture, we are going to talk about one such voice, which of course, if we compare uh, with the sort of poets that we have discussed so far, is of course, the youngest of all, but then there is a lot of aggression, there is a lot of rebellion, there is a lot of assertiveness in this poet. And the name of this poet is Meena Kandaswami. Now, Meena Kandaswami actually is known for her assertive voice. And not only for her assertive voice, but then there is actually a reason behind. Because when Meena started uh, writing her poems, it appeared as if we are having another Kamala Das. We have already talked a lot about it. We have also talked about Meena Alexander, but then Meena Alexander was a different sort of poet. But here, when we talk about Meena Kandaswami, we find that Meena Kandaswami uh, is a voice of Dalit literature. Now, till now, you might have simply been hearing about different sorts of writing. But then, here is a poet, especially a woman poet, who talks about Dalit literature. And then the description of her poems actually give you an impression that not only Meena stands as a representative of Dalit voices and she lends her voice to the voice less people, but at the same time she has in her poetic corpus another voice that is the voice of a woman. How they have been doubly discarded doubly suppressed, doubly subjected, and how they have been doubly persecuted. We find, because when we talk about Dalit writings, which actually emerged in the 1960s, and which talks about uh, Dalit lives, uh, which talks about uh, Dalit's uh, realities, and their discrimination and atrocities, that they have been a part of it. Meena actually uh, is a representative voice, who explores the social reality of our society. Till now, we have uh, simply been hearing about many Dalit voices who have not only through their autobiographies and through their fictional works have uh, tried to portray reality, uh, but uh, in the world of uh, Meena uh, Kandasami, uh, we find that she not only includes the ideological insights of Ambedkar, but she actually represents Dalit consciousness. Dalit uh, literature, which is spread across languages like Marathi, Kannada, uh, Hindi, and English. In the case of discussing Meena Kandaswami's world, we find that women, though they have been portrayed as being victimized in a patriarchal order, but they also have become a victim of caste-based society on a greater level. Many of you might have come across uh, the fictional works of uh, Bama, then uh, Bebitai Kamle, Komud Pawar, Sujata Girda, Meena Kandaswami, and others who are actually writing um, for the women who have been suppressed and who have been subjected to different sorts of discriminations. Now, in this regard, uh, before we move on to the works of uh, Meena Kandaswami, let us take uh, a very small observation. Uh, by Gopal Guru, who says that Dalit male writers do not take serious note of the literary output of Dalit women. That is why we say Dalit women, uh, they are doubly subjected to discrimination and tend to be dismissive of it. Dalit women rightly question why they are not considered for the top positions in Dalit literary conferences and institutions. Now, when we come to Meena Kandaswami, we will find 
that Meena Kandasamy, who was actually born in 1984, and that way we can find how she is uh, a contemporary poet and an activist, because as a poet, she is an activist, you will find in her works a lot of aggression. No, it appears as if her emotions are totally uncontrolled when she talks about these discriminations. So, born in Chennai in 1984, uh, Meena holds a PhD in sociolinguistics. She was actually a writer in residence at the University of Iowa's International Writing Program in 2009. She also had uh, the opportunity of being a Charles Wallace India Trust Fellow at the University of Kent in 2011. Meena is a novelist, a poet, translator, academician, journalist and activist. But we have to understand the poetic world of Meena Kandasamy uh, and uh, we have we have taken Meena, Meena Kandasamy to see the sort of activism and many of us will find uh, that it is actually an echo of Kamala Das though in a different way. She adds the caste flavor apart from the women's question. Meena has become a prominent voice of Dalit writings. Uh, she had also been an actor who was visible in the Malayalam film Oral Pokkam. Meena writes against the systematic subjugation of women. Now, having understood uh, Meena's uh, bio, we also can see that Meena was hailed as the first Indian Dalit poet who was writing in English. She also got the chance of editing the Dalit, which was a bi-monthly alternative English magazine of the Dalit media work. She writes her womanness, her Tamilness and low outcastness. She has herself said and admitted, my gender, language and castlessness, my gender, language and castlessness were not anything that I had to be ashamed of. So, initially when Meena started writing, of course, even when a new writer comes, there are lots of criticism and all. But Meena says that she is not ashamed of her gender, language and castlessness. I wrote poetry very well, aware of who I was. I was also sure of how I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be taken on my own terms. I wanted to be totally bare and intensely exposed to the world through my writings. I wanted it to be my rebellion against the world. So, that way shows Meena's firmness, Meena's determination uh, to raise a sort of tirade against the sort of discrimination uh, that women have been facing, not only because of their being women, but also their uh, being of a different caste. Kandasamy's uh, literary corpus involves only two poetry collections because she has become a very famous uh, because of her uh, novels and other writings. But the two uh, collections uh, that she has to her credit are very significant and the one is entitled Touch. See, see, look at the title, Touch, where she raises the caste question, fine. And, uh, and then the another one is Miss Militancy, Miss Militancy, where Meena also talks about how women can also take a revenge and then she takes some references uh, from uh, some early writings, from some early writings of uh, uh, Tamil literature uh, where uh, she mentions in, in uh, Miss Militancy uh, what uh, Meena says, she refers to caste, caste operation and then she mentions the story of Kannaki and Kobilan, Kannaki and Kobilan and the entire uh, book has in its backdrop uh, Kannagi's, uh, Kannagi's uh, revenge, fine. See actually uh, Meena tries to uh, make it a uh, uh, immortal story for the king's punishment of her husband, of Kannagi's husband with the death penalty by making a bomb of the left breast blowing the whole city. Now, while she uh, takes into reference uh, this uh, uh, story, Tamil epic, Sila Pathi Karam. But then here she talks about the question of every woman, how every woman can take a revenge against the sort of discrimination that they, they have to uh, face. Then her novels include uh, The Gypsy Goddess, which came out in 2014. Then When I Hit You, 2018. And then Exquisite Cadavers in 2019. 
Her very first collection entitled Touch, which came out in the year 2006, and Meena actually became a very famous with this. This collection has got 84 poems, fine. And this is divided into seven sections, and all these sections have different names. Bring him to worship you, touch, add some spice to that more congenial spot, lines of control, slander is a slaughterhouse, and then their daughters. So, majority of uh, the poems in these sections, they not only talk about caste, they not only talk about touch, they not only talk about Meena's tirade against the high class, high caste people, but then she raises the question of untouchability and then she also talks about how this male dominated society, this patriarchal society has given a different treatment uh, to women. Not only does she talk about question of women's identity, but then there is a cry for love. There is a cry for the demand for the equality in terms of love. Let us take one poem uh, from this collection, which is actually uh, the uh, title of this collection entitled Touch. And you will find how very spontaneously does she uh, interrogate and she says, you will have known almost every knowledgeable thing about the charms and temptations that touch could hold. Fine. She says that uh, touch is a very significant uh, feeling. But then you, you might have known almost every knowledgeable thing, but what you do not know is, and she continues the poem, but you will never have known that touch, the taboo to your transcendence when crystallized in caste was a paraphernalia of undeserving hate. So now, people may talk about touch, but then this touch is some way or the other subjected to a sort of hatred. Why Meena becomes so aggressive? Why she becomes so assertive? As she says that her writing is full of her activism and she says, the poet in me will not exist without the activist in me. So, she can be considered to be an activist poet who actually raises uh, many uh, questions. But her activism can be shown in a different light as if it is not only a sort of interrogation, it is also a sort of message to for the reformation of the society, reconstruction of the society, not the recreation of it. So, if we have a look at the themes of her poem, we can find that Meena is also like uh, many uh, voices of marginalized people, she is the representative voice of the voiceless people, fine. And there is an element of Dalit consciousness through resistance and through women's liberation. Meena actually tries to make everyone realize that love is an essential uh, element not only of life but also of poem. We can take uh, one poem once again from Touch, where she says, and, and uh, this is uh, not in a way uh, on, on caste, but this is in a way uh, the general trend of what happens in our society when a woman's uh, question of marriage is being discussed. And then in a very scathing way, Meena says, but when they come to see you for a possible bride, look at the floor. I mean right from the beginning you are sown, you are made to realize that you have to look at the floor, the fading carpet and the unsapely toes of the visitors who will inspect the weight, will inspect the weight of your gold, the paleness of your complexion, the length of your hair and ask you questions about the degrees you hold and the transparency of your past. I mean, why is such a question only to a woman who is going to be married? Is it not a sort of discrimination? So, Meena raises a very genuine concern, not only on the basis of the caste line, but then she also talks about uh, the women in general. And while she talks about uh, the caste factor, she actually brings to question one poem entitled Mariamma, which is actually a Hindu goddess. Hindu goddess of rain and fertility. 
and then she says that how even this Hindu goddess who even being a woman, how she also joined uh, the gang of the upper class and she in a very pathetic manner, in a very sympathetic manner, in a very pitiable manner, in a very commiserating way, she says, we understand why upper caste gods and their good girl, much married, father fucked, virgin, vegetarian, oh so pure goddesses born in their golden chariots don't come to our streets. We know the reasons for their non-entry into slums. Now see also in a way a uh, hint set uh, the pitiable condition of these poor people living in slums and then she says actually our poverty would soil their ears and our labor corrupt their souls. But Mariamma, when you are still getting those roosters and goats, why have you stopped coming to our doors? Mari, our girl, since when did you join their gang? You also became a part of it. I was not so sure of it. You also being a woman, how did you part your ways and how did you join their company? So, in one poem after another, we can find this sort of tirade and you know, Meena does not believe in any particular religion or in any particular faith, rather even when she questions Gandhi, whom all of us provide a lot of respect and then, but then she interrogates and what she says, you called us Harijans, fine, goody goody guys of a by God, God, Ram, Ram, hey Ram, boo. I mean, it appears that in her aggression, she also forgets the standards, fine? Because the poem begins, who, 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 Mahatma, sorry, no, truth, non-violence, stop it, enough taboo. And then she says, you called us names because you called us Harijans. Don't ever act like a holy saint. So there is an attack even on Gandhi. We can see through you, impure you. Remember how you dealt with your poor wife. But they wrote your books, they made your life, they stuffed you up, they imposted true and sew you up, filled you with virtue and gave you all that glossy deeds. Enough region, we will leak you. You knew, you bloody well knew. Caste won't go, they won't let it go. It haunts us, even though you might have tried a lot that caste will go, but has caste really gone? No. And then she says, she actually reminds Gandhi and says, but they killed you, the naked you, your blood with mud was gui gu, sadist fool, you killed your body many times before this too. Bapu, Bapu, you big fraud, we hate you. See, such is a sort of aggression, such is a sort of hatred, such is a sort of deterministic views and one can find that through such views what as a poet she tries to, she actually tries to bring a sort of reform. And again in one poem after another, not only she tries to experiment, she rather breaks the rules of poems and in this poem entitled Advaita the ultimate question, you can find how she tries to make it a sort of formula which we can call hieroglyphs another sort of writing and the poem begins with non-dualism, Atma, Self, Brahma, God are equal and as the poem proceeds towards the end she will say, can my untouchable Atma and your Brahmin Atma ever be one? So she puts a question my dear friends that will this, will all this talk, no, all this big talks can my untouchable Atma and your Brahmid Atma ever be one? Can we really bridge these gaps? We cannot. And then again in another poem entitled Dead Woman Walking, which is from Miss Militancy, I have already told you how it is, it is actually a sort of revenge. Here in this poem, she talks about a woman who simply because she was having some problems, she was deserted. She was abandoned and what she says actually can bring tears to any sensible creature. She says, I am a dead woman walking asylum corridors with faltering step, with felted flying hair, with hollowed cheeks that offset bulging eyes. And as the poem proceeds, she says, 
Once I was a wife, beautiful, married to a merchant, shifty eyed, living the life until he was lost in listless doubt of how what I gave him was more delicious than whatever, whatever had been given to me. I mean, is marriage only a give and take relationship? And then when mercenary motives involve this beautiful bond, the marriage actually comes to fail, falter, fritter away. And she says, his mathematics could never explain the magic of my multiplying love. My love kept on multiplying, but he was very calculative. This discrepancy drove him away a new job in another city and then he hitched himself to a fresh and formless wife. Of course, as all women do, I found out. I wept in pain, I welled, I walked on my blood, I went to God, but is there any justice there also? And she says, I sang in praise of dancing dervishes, I made music for this world to devour on some dejected day. But finally, some called me mad, some called me mother, but all of them led me here to this land of the living dead. So ultimately, I was cheated in the course of love. And how can one talk to and how can one share in the name of marriage and bond all these mantras and all these traditional rites and all, ultimately I have been considered mad, I have been considered simply a mother because man's eyes are always shifting. Then there are poems after poem you can find and in this poem also, this poem will provoke you, here you can find there is a repetition of the lines. And this repetition also stands for a sort of assertiveness where there are certain, you know, uh, sentences which may really tear you apart where she says, this poem is riddled, this poem is not a Hindu, this poem is eager to offend, this poem is shallow and distorted and it continues, this poem denigrates Hindu, this poem has a hidden agenda, this poem shows them in poor light. This poem concentrates on the negative aspects of Hinduism and towards the end she says, this poem declares itself the Hindu canon, this poem follows the monkey, worships the horse, this poem supersedes the Vedas and again, so while we discuss this poem smears Rama for his suspicious mind, this poem was once forced into Sati. So through this poem, she actually tells that all the different things that have been done, were they really fair enough? She questions even Rama uh, for his doubting Sita. And in one po poem, you know, in one poem, uh, she also mentions, actually this poem is very beautiful where it is called Another Paradise Lost. And this is actually an interaction between a snake and the poet. And the snake is coiled near the fridge and the poet wants to kill the snake. But then the snake tells its own story and when the snake says, I was Nahusha the Great, actually this Nahusha was uh, uh, from a line of kings and having uh, served for many, you know, thousand years, Nahusha actually wanted to go to heaven and went heaven and there Nahusha was also venerated. But then Nahusha one day asked a question. I wanted to know why caste was there, why people suffered because of their karmas. I questioned the gods and the learned sages there, I asked them what would happen if an high born did manual work just like the low born. So I was not supposed to, in the kingdom of the heaven, I was not supposed to ra raise even any question. And then the snake says, in this tale there was no forbidden fruit, no sick and fickle minded woman, tradition triumphed over region and the good were cast away, I let the serpent go, happy that he had given my hungry mind a story. The snake actually told that I was simply thrown away because I raised a question and I was said that I was banished from paradise for 60 million years I will have to roam on this earth. And the poet towards the end says, while I gave him the freedom of safe passage, I vowed never to kill serpents. So, we often hate, we often are afraid of snakes, but the poet says that when I heard the story of the snake, 
I realized brutally that this was just another occupational hazard for choosing a life where I was to be showing solidarity with activists and dissenters. You cannot raise a question, you cannot dissent. Rather, you have to be submissive. And so, the poet does not uh, kill uh, the snake. Rather, she says that I got another occupational hazard for choosing a life and this was a life of uh, rebellion. She also, I mean Meena Kandasamy also retells Ramayana in a different way where she says that since Rama was uh, doubtful and Rama had gone to the forest and you know when Rama went to the forest uh, he perhaps had done a mistake and had abandoned uh, Sita and Sita had to choose a random man and the poetess says, I picked herself a random man for that first night of fervor. This one was all hands and all heads and he spoke only in whispers by the time she left. This stranger's lap she had learned all about love first to last. So, perhaps even Sita was also, also denied love that is what uh, she retells Ramayana in a different way and Sita also had to take a random access man. Of course, uh, we may criticize uh, uh, Kanda Swami uh, as a poet who has actually taken a tirade against all sorts of discriminations and all. But then what she says in defense is, my poetry is naked, my poetry smells of blood, my poetry salutes sacrifice, my poetry speaks like my people, my poetry speaks for my people. And but to say uh, that uh, Kanda Swami did not talk of love will perhaps be an injustice because Kanda Swami was all through struggling only for love, only for realization of love, not on the base of caste, not on the base of colors, but on the base of selfless emotions. And in one poem entitled Fringed Light, what she says is quite true. She says, love. I will promise you a substitute because there has been a tradition we say that candle uh, is uh, the representative of love, but she says no. I could be that piece of holy camphor so safely locked away from prying hands and dearest when I burn for you that single time nothing shall remain of me or of you except that flash of memory our blending shall be so sublime, so intense, so total. So, love is not one sided, love actually should be two sided and she says that let me substitute a camphor and we too will burn and we too will merge in each other, submerge in each other, dissolve in each other, create, create a sort of unity. Come, consume me, devastate me love if you ever will but with a force that I will forever remember. That actually should be the capability of love, that actually should be the unity of love, that actually should be the essence of love. When we analyze uh, Meena Kandasamy as a poet, we can find Meena Kandasamy examining Indian tradition of dominance of one particular community over the degraded which we call over are uh, the marginalized ones. She actually tries to deconstruct Indian myth and religions to find the real cause of discrimination against Dalit and uh, that is why she has at times also criticized uh, Eklabian in one of his poems Eklabian. She says that Dronacharya also should be held responsible uh, because he was casteist and that is why he did not give lessons to uh, Eklabya. She also tries to examine the plight of women and in one poem when she says to make her yours and yours alone you pushed her deeper into harems, again the question of women, where she could see the sunlight only from the lattice windows. I mean, women are not to be imprisoned, rather they are not to be domesticated into drudgery as she was just another territory. Women, woman is not a territory. She is not to be worn out by wars, a slave who maintained simply your numbers. So, having discussed uh, the poems of Meena Kandaswami, we find uh, that uh, Meena is completely obsessed with the sort of maltreatment that has been meted out 
not only to women, but also to uh, women of different castes and especially on the basis of caste. We find that not only does she critique Gandhi for naming Dalits as Harijans, but she also tries to uh, produce and uh, present a counter narrative to the discourse of upper caste people. Uh, Meena presents her strong voice against the casteist mindset. She actually also in one of the poems uh, entitled Algorithm for Converting a Sudra into Brahmin, she gives a formula. Uh, take a beautiful sudra girl, make her marry a Brahmin, let her give birth to his female child, let, let this child marry a Brahmin, repeat a step 3 to 4, 6 times, display the end product, it is a Brahmin. So, at times she also tries to create humor, but then before we conclude, we have to see that Meena has re-emerged, I mean after Kamala Das, she has emerged as a champion not only of women, but of subaltern voice in Indian uh, poetry in English. She presents an alternative discourse of identity politics and that is why in the preface uh, to her book, what Kamala Das says is dying and then resurrecting herself again and again in a country that refuses to forget the unkind myths of caste and perhaps of religion. Meena carries as her twin self her shadow, the dark cynicism of youth that must help to her survive. Happiness is a hollow world for fools to inhabit, cries Meena at a moment of revelation. Revelations come to herself frequently and prophecies linger at her lips. Now to conclude or to sum up, let us once again uh, take uh, the lines of her poem Aggression where she says, sometimes the outward signals of inward struggles take colossal forms and the revolution happens because our dreams explode most of the time. And I think Meena's assertions in the from forms of dream, in the forms of poetry uh, will come a long way and will uh, bring a sort of realization in the course of time. With this, we come to the end of uh, this lecture uh, and once again uh, repeating what Meena says, aggression is the best kind of trouble uh, suiting. So, with this, let me come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much. I wish you all a good day.